Fox News alert. New reaction from Capitol Hill and around the nation after Ambassador Nikki Haley has resigned at the U.N. President Trump speaking with Ambassador Haley in the Oval Office of the White House for today's announcement and something that took nearly everyone by surprise. You're watching Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner. Here today, Fox Business anchor Dagan McDowell, National Security Analyst Morgan Ortegas, former Director of Strategic Communications for the Hillary Clinton campaign, Adrian Elrod. In the center seat, we call him Outnumbered. By name, though, Tom Dupree, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General under George, President George W. Bush. Great to have you. Thank you, Harris. Delighted to be here today. As you always. carry that big breaking news in a backpack. I do. I, do. I see you into the building, and I'm like, uh oh. Uh oh. If Tom's here, there's going to be big news coming. So glad you're here. Let's Thank get you. to it. A short time ago, you watched it here live on Fox. President Trump revealing Ambassador Haley informed him six months ago of her intentions to resign from her position at the United Nations. The president also saying the ambassador will be staying on through the job through the end of the year, and he thanked her for her service. She's done an incredible job. She's a fantastic person, very importantly, but she also is somebody that gets it. We're all happy for you in one way, but we hate to lose. Uh, you'll, hopefully, you'll be coming back at some point. It has been an honor of a lifetime. I, you know, I said I am such a lucky girl to have been able to lead the state that raised me and to serve a country I love so very much. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live with more. John? Well, to say that we were surprised would be an, an understatement. I mean, nobody had any inkling, Harris, that this was going to happen. Nikki Haley didn't tell the people that worked for her until this morning what was going on, and a lot of people here at the, who work at the White House uh, were kind of blindsided by this as well. But it all seemed to be very carefully orchestrated. The president talked about this idea of when you do it in a written statement, when you say somebody's leaving, people go, whoa, what's behind that? What's really going on here? So the president wanted to take a moment to sit down with uh, Ambassador Haley in the Oval Office and very calmly explain what was going on and give her a big White House send-off. Here's part of what the president said. At the end of the year, Nikki will be leaving and uh, will be in constant touch. I know that. Whenever you have any ideas, you're going to call me because you know all the players. And that was really the thing I think she did best at the United Nations. She got to know the players. She got to know China, Russia, India. She knows everybody on a very first-name basis, and they like her. Except for maybe a couple, which is normal. <laughs> right? They can't all like you, but they, they do. They really like her. And I think maybe more importantly, they respect her. Now, the last eight months, uh, the last eight months, the last eight years for Nikki Haley have been a rather intense time. She ticked off her time as uh, South Carolina governor for six years, during which there was a big hurricane. There was a thousand year flood that happened there. Uh, there was the shooting at the church in Charleston, South Carolina, all of which she had to deal with as governor. And then she went right from that into being the United Nations ambassador. Uh, which is certainly like jumping from the frying pan directly into the, the fire, only you're, you're dealing with international as opposed to just a, a single state. She also listed off a, a series of accomplishments that she said the United States uh, has completed uh, during her time as United Nations ambassador. So, so I put the question to her in the Oval Office. I was fortunate enough to be the, uh, the television pool correspondent in during that, uh, that uh, little time there with the president, Nikki Haley. I said, well, well, given all of the things that you just listed, why would you want to leave that behind? Listen to what she said. I'm a believer in term limits. I think you have to be selfless enough to know when you step aside and allow someone else to do the job. So thank you, Mr. President. You, it's Mr. been an Mr. honor of a lifetime. And I will say this um, for all of you that are going to ask about 2020. No, I'm not running for 2020. I can promise you what I'll be doing is campaigning for this one. Nobody asked her the question, but she volunteered the answer. I'm not running for 2020. She'll be supporting President Trump. Uh, the president said that he's got a number of people in mind to potentially succeed. Nikki Haley is U.N. ambassador. He'll probably make an announcement sometime within three to four weeks. I I've checked with a number of people here at the White House. Uh, the only name that's kind of floating around at this point is that of the current ambassador to Germany, 
Rick Grinnell, who will be familiar to people who watch Fox News because he was a, he was a uh, contributor to Fox for an awfully long time. He has a deep history at the United Nations. Uh, he was the uh, U.N. spokesperson there during the Negroponte days uh, back in the Bush administration uh, when the uh, in the run up to the war to Iraq. So he's got deep experience at the United Nations. He was one of the names under consideration during the transition to be U.N. ambassador. The president picked Nikki Haley. So uh, maybe this time around it's Ambassador Grinnell's turn. Well, we don't know, but we'll find out sometime in the next three to four weeks. Well, and the president said, John, and I don't know that we know the texture of this yet, uh, that there's a big announcement at the rally tonight. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't think it would be uh, a no, replacement at this point, but, but it is interesting. Anything more about that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's not the yeah, it's not the replace it's not the successor to Nikki Haley. Now the president will be making an announcement about something called E15 gasoline. Uh, current blends of gasoline are typically 10% ethanol. During certain months of the year, uh, filling stations, service stations are allowed to sell what's called E15. It's a 15% ethanol. Uh, the president will direct the EPA today to uh, study whether or not uh, E15, as it's known, can be sold all year long. That would be a big boon to corn producers who produce a lot of corn for ethanol in important states like Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota as well. Uh, I also hear that the president will have over to the White House just prior to leaving for Iowa, uh, people like Senator Joni Ernst, uh, Senator Chuck Grassley, John Thune, Senator Fisher, and maybe Dakota, Senator Sass Iowa, as well. Right, yeah. those states yeah, that, that, that... That whole area where the, you know, they got all the corn stocks. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Have lived in that area before. Before I let you go, war on Nikki Haley right now. There seemed to be a warmth in the room, jovial. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I saw something I've actually never seen before. When the president said, I'll take all your questions, anybody? Anybody? Crickets. What was going yeah. on in there? Uh, I mean, he just was, he was in a mood to chat, and he eventually, you yeah, know, but the I didn't want had no more questions. They have the president <laughs> of the United States and Ambassador Haley. I mean, a woman in that position, someone that the president was praising in their presence. Just real quickly, that 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 back and forth, you were in the room. Tell us about I, it. I was. Well, I asked six or seven questions, and I didn't want to hog the floor, so I, you know, opened it for some of my other colleagues, and you know, two or three of them asked questions, but. I've never seen the president say any more questions and, and then heard nothing <laughs> come out of anybody's mouth. It he really was point, pretty extraordinary. Uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, at one point said to Nikki Haley, he would love to have her back in any capacity she'd <clears throat> want to return. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about there being a, a warmth in the mm -hmm. room. There, there was one still photograph that I saw on our air um, in the last hour where it's, it's a face on of Nikki Haley as she's looking up at the president and you can you can see in her eyes that there is a, a real affection for the president there. The, the two of them are friends. They haven't always seen eye to eye, but they've always been able to have good conversations with each other. But, I, you know, unless she's a really good actress, I think that she was, you know, there was something in her eyes there that said that she really appreciates this president and she'll probably miss being at the United Nations. But she's got some other things that she wants to do. She hasn't named it yet, but we'll find out soon. All right. John Roberts, thank you very much. Always great to you get bet. a little extra word from you. Thanks, Harris. Okay. So, uh, Tom, you just heard John talking about the praise, maybe mutual praise. Nikki Haley actually has a, a history of praising this particular president. People may not know that so much, but it's true. That, that is true. And look, the fact is Nikki Haley is an absolute superstar, and she is going out at the top of her game. She has served in this role as U.N. ambassador doing two of the most tumultuous, transformative years in U.S. foreign policy. I think she will be very fondly remembered uh, for someone who commanded the respect on the world stage as a forceful and articulate spokesman for U.S. interests. She's someone who I think pushed the president sometimes in a particular direction, and she was always complimentary of him, but even when they disagreed, she was always very forceful but respectful behind the scenes. And I think her fingerprints are all over where U.S. foreign policy is today. When you look at the high level of uh, departure, if you will, from this president with the ambassador, it's interesting. In the Oval Office, a place where you see heads of state, right? right? And there she sits, this powerful person at the U.N. outgoing.
It's a fascinating moment uh, because it happened, you know, on a day when we thought we were all going to be talking about Kavanaugh and being sworn in last night. For the people that I've been talking to in Washington that are close to her, they all say that she's been saying for quite some time that she wanted to be done at the two-year mark. Remember, she didn't come into this from the Senate. She came in as a governor, where she's the chief executive. And whenever you go into the UN, which is a place uh, that I've long, you know, that I've long observed, it's sort of like going to the Star Wars intergalactic, you know, assembly, right? All of these languages, all of these people. She's there at a time whenever uh, the administration is unpopular because they're doing a lot of things that they told the voters and the American people that they would do. And she's having to fight on a daily basis on, uh, you know, with the Russians, with the Chinese. I could see how it can be quite daunting after two years. But as you said, Tom, um, she goes out on the highest note possible. Yeah. You know, Adrian, what kind of bipartisan difference has Ambassador Nikki Haley made in that role? Is it somewhat like when she was governor of South Carolina? and she had some great relationships right. on her team and the other one. Well, I do think she's certainly one of the most well-respected cabinet members of President Trump's among, among Democrats in a bipartisan way. Um, she's had to face a lot of really challenging foreign policy issues under the Trump administration, and she's done a very good job of sort of striking that balance of being, you know, representing the president at the U.N., but also, you know, having to deal with some, with, you know, a, a number of foreign policy issues in that position. For me, I wonder why she's leaving now. Why leave before the midterms? I understand that she's been thinking about this for the last few she's months. She's not leaving before the midterms. Well, she, she announced, rather, that she's leaving before the midterms. I find that timing to be a little, um, you know, interesting, but... You know I can't answer that. You, yeah. you know what it does do, and, and uh, I'm curious to know if you agree with this, Dagan. Uh, it gives a great set of accomplishments that you can list for Republicans and foreign policy, as Tom was hinting at, at a time 28 days out, and then we just fill in the blank with, that's never a bad timing, it's, it's positive, that sort of thing. And it also gets ahead of this potentially leaking by any of those gossipy people in Washington. So if they've had private conversations about her making this decision, get ahead of it. Yeah. And also it puts out front and center today a role model for all women, mm. somebody who is strong and commanding and fierce and eloquent and elegant at the same time. She has been, you know, when she was criticized, remember earlier this year when she came out and announced some um, that we would impose new sanctions against Russia, that Larry Kudlow, then the new economic advisor, said that she was suffering from momentary confusion. Oh, you know yeah, what her yeah, response was? That. With all due respect, I don't get confused. And then she got an apology <laughs> from mm -hmm. Kudlow after that and she also in terms of the relationship with the president she wrote that editorial in the Washington Post in response to that anonymous editorial that was written in the New York Times and she went if you don't mind me just reading well you know what part let's of it. do this because she was also on Fox and Friends I don't know if you'll remember yes, right after the UN I General Assembly too. speech and she was defending the president let's watch that kind of in the same vein but we'll let the president be talked about by Nikki Haley You've got a president who is nonstop going all the time. The cabinet's just trying to keep up with him. I mean, he's getting things done left and right. How can you honestly think a man who doesn't know what he's doing is getting this much done on jobs, on trade deals, on foreign policy? Look at the stock market. I mean, Americans are living better than they ever have. And you're going to go question his leadership? But she has been out there speaking those kinds of words for the president and also tough when she felt like she needed to be. And I, reading the end of that editorial I was talking about in the Washington Post that Nikki Haley wrote, uh, to Mr. or Mrs. Ms. Anonymous, I say step up and help the administration do great things for the country. If you disagree with some policies, make your case directly to the president. If that doesn't work and you're truly bothered by the direction of the administration, then resign on principle. Mm -hmm. There's no shame in that. Do not stay in your position and secretly undermine the president and the rest of the team. It's cowardly, anti-democratic, and it's a disservice to our country. So it's interesting, too, Tom, because uh, the president knew about this reportedly, and, and now we know directly from him six months ago. I love it when grown folk can keep a secret. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
I mean, the nation is depending on that to happen. And apparently the only time that can happen is when it's between the president and Ambassador Nikki Haley. Um, nothing leaked for six months. And that was actually a good thing for this country because we needed to concentrate on other things. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, the fact that a secret of this magnitude could be kept in Washington, D.C. for so right. long is extraordinary. And look, the fact is, kind of digging what you were saying, Nikki Haley is a strong, powerful, plain speaker who I think really could communicate, not just with the world audience, but with the people in America about what the president's agenda was and what the United States was trying to accomplish in foreign policy. And so I certainly hope that although she's at least stepping out of her current Role. My guess is we have not heard the last from Nikki Haley. I do not think this is the final chapter in the Nikki Haley story, and I very much hope she will remain a vibrant part of our foreign policy. How discussions. about this chapter? The New York Times has obtained, uh, excuse me, the Washington Post has obtained, very different, the Washington Post has obtained the uh, resignation letter from Ambassador Haley. I just want to read a couple of blurbs here. Dear Mr. President, uh, it has been an, an immense honor to serve our country in your administration. I cannot thank you enough. You will recall that when you offered me the position of U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations in November 2016, I accepted the offer based on some conditions. And those conditions included serving in your cabinet and on the National Security Council and being free to speak, speak my mind on issues of the day. You made those commitments and you have absolutely <clears throat> kept them all. Uh, and she goes on to say, as a businessman, I expect you will appreciate my sense that returning from government to the private sector is not a step down, but a step up, huh. which is interesting, <laughs> right? Yeah. To give you time to select a replacement and to give the Senate time to consider your selection, I am prepared to continue to serve until January 2019. Uh, your thoughts? That's a really great point about Senate confirmation because as we talk about the politics of all of this, of who the president could name, uh, there's a lot of people that, that are being speculated about that could just never get through the Senate. And I think that's one of the reasons that Rick Grinnell, ambassador uh, to Germany, who has been through Senate confirmation, his name is out there. Uh, Dina Powell is also someone's name who we've heard, who we've heard a lot. She was the deputy national security advisor uh, for the first year of the administration, although not a Senate confirmed physician. But I have a prediction, Harris. You know, this happened today, it's Tuesday, and guess who's coming to the White House on Thursday for lunch? Kanye. <laughs> okay, she's joking. <laughs> Why not? I, I was waiting, and, and Morgan is not a person who speculates, so I'm like, where are we going here? Uh, and, and last word in that resignation letter, I look forward to supporting your re-election as president. Uh, second to the last paragraph, with best wishes and deep gratitude, Nikki Haley. Also extremely interesting, Adrian, as you look at the political spectrum out there, imagine it. Uh, Nikki Haley on the campaign trail for Donald J. Trump second term. Absolutely. Yeah, she would she most certainly be one of his top surrogates, no question. Well, she didn't campaign for him during 2016. She exactly. was critical and supported Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, not President Trump, and she still got that job. Exactly. And served exactly. admirably. When all of us were wrapping up our evening last night, this was actually the big story and continues to be Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh clocked in his first day on the job today. His confirmation is energizing both sides of the political aisle in next month's midterm elections. We'll talk why and how. And more in today's big news about Ambassador Nikki Haley departing as America's top diplomat at the UN, the void she will leave, and her impact on the global stage as the president looks to fill the spot. Stay close. Fox News Alert as we cover continued new reaction now to U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley's resignation. From world allies and America's foreign policy leaders now we're hearing. Ambassador Haley spoke alongside President Trump a short time ago inside the Oval Office. They reflected on what they believe has been great progress on the global stage. Look at what has happened in two years with the United States on foreign policy. Now, the United States is respected. Countries may not like what we do, but they respect what we do. They know that if we say we're going to do something, we follow it through, and the president proved that, whether it was with the chemical weapons in Syria, whether it's with NATO, saying that other countries have to pay their share. I mean, whether it's the trade deals, which have been amazing, they get that the president means business. The U.S. is strong in a way that should make all Americans very proud. And here's the president. When we came into office, uh, it was almost inevitable in the minds of many that we were going to war with North Korea. Iran looked like 
a real problem. It was a question of when would they take over the Middle East prior to my coming here. And now Iran is fighting for their lives. We've just made a lot of progress on so many other fronts also. And I think the world, as Nikki said, the world is really respecting the United States again. You heard the president talking about some of the things that the United States is juggling, complex issues with North Korea, Iran, and China. State Department correspondent Rich Edson has more now from the State Department. I would imagine a very electric place this morning. It is, Harris. You know, the U.N. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, caught some folks off guard here this morning. She announced to her staff, uh, many of her staff, according to an official, that she was leaving this morning, then went over to the White House and spoke with the president. And uh, that's the uh, discussion that you just saw there and we've been seeing throughout the day. She took over as uh, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations at the beginning of the Trump administration when plenty of folks in Washington and in capitals around the country and around the world were looking for some guidance as to what the specific of Trump foreign policy were going to be. She started out working with the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, often speaking on issues before he spoke on issues. She took a very traditional Republican foreign policy line when it came to Russia and on other issues. Uh, that transitioned over under Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. They worked together on the pressure campaign to try to get countries around the world, the United Nations Security Council, to cut off North Korea. That effort still continues. In fact, she was just with the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo a couple of months ago up at the United Nations pushing China and Russia to enforce the sanctions that they said that they uh, agreed to and enacted. Beyond that, though, she uh, was at the middle of U.S. foreign policy at the United Nations. Uh, traditional U.S. allies applauding the United States on the response in Syria to the chemical attack, uh, the pushback against Russia in many places. But she also caught plenty of criticism from especially European American allies when the United States withdrew uh, from the Iran nuclear deal, other issues like cutting off U.S. funding to a Palestinian aid organization at the United Nations, uh, withdrawing the United Nations, United States from the U.N., um, uh, the uh, the uh, Human Human Rights Council, that's something that the U.S. caught plenty of criticism. Uh, and the line from the United States was very much, look, these organizations need reform. The U.S. isn't going to contribute to them. Uh, and so she led those efforts at the United Nations, caught the criticism from many traditional American allies. But there's still plenty of work in her office left to do as she's going to stay there through 2018. And a lot of it has to do with North Korea, those sanctions, and keeping all those countries on board applying that pressure while the U.S. negotiates with Kim John Un. Back to you. Great. Thank you very much. But that was some great information. Uh, Morgan, you know, as we look at this and, and you listen to, to Rich's reporting, it really puts in the front view how much has been accomplished, but so much has to be done now. And as Iran's about to potentially, mm -hmm. not Iran, boy, that was a slip, wasn't it? <laughs> North Korea is potentially yeah. going to let us see some of those missile sites and right. inspectors in. We wanted it to be Iran. That didn't work out. Yeah, a couple of points, you're right, Harris, and a couple of points about how the next US, UN ambassador will be chosen. What a lot of people don't realize is it's not a cabinet position. The UN ambassador actually reports to uh, Secretary Pompeo. He has the, well, it actually technically reports to the Undersecretary of International Affairs, a guy named Ambassador Moli, who's in the job at the moment, but no one knows who that is. That's fine. So um, Secretary Pompeo clearly has a lot of confidence um, uh, with the president. They have a good relationship. I expect that he will have a very very big role in picking uh, who the next UN ambassador will be because that person will will report mm. to him. When you look at what Nikki Haley was able to accomplish in, under, in the Trump administration over the last two years, it's going to be difficult to replicate that in the next two years because we're entering a time where we have three major things going on from a foreign policy perspective. One, in three weeks, new uh, U.S. sanctions against the Iranian regime will come into place. Dagan will be able to talk extensively about what that may do to the oil market and how that might drive up mm -hmm. uh, oil prices. Prices, that's going to be an incredibly contentious issue because, as we saw just a few weeks ago, when the president was at the UN, he led the meeting uh, at the UN Security Council on Iran sanctions. That's not to mention North Korea and China. So there's going to be right. a lot of very unpopular stuff, stuff that I think this administration absolutely should be pushing, but it's going to be a slog for anyone who's in that position. So, you know, what's interesting about that, too, when you talk about uh, toughness on Iran, it also makes them a bit more dangerous in terms of being desperate, I, I would think, is as well. Um, and they are known supporters of terrorism around the world. So, I mean, it, it is something to think about, too, not just the money portion Absolutely. of it. Right. The number one state sponsor of terrorism when we inked that very deal and mm -hmm. sent pallets of cash in the middle of the night to Iran as a, a ransom in part. One thing to, uh, of note that uh, I'll bring up, 
the, our relationship with China has gotten worse and much more tense just in the last couple of days with Mike Pompeo, right. the Secretary of State, exchanging some testy language, some testy words with Foreign Minister uh, Wang Yi in Beijing. And this is right after Vice President Mike Pence just last week outlined a shift in our strategy in dealing with mm -hmm. China to from engagement to confrontation. We still have, again, a very tough trade fight, but this all wraps into you hammer them on uh, the finances and the trade and their economy, and again, you starve the military complex. Can, of can money. I ask you a question about that, though? Sure. You know, is this the first time that China has really seen us act this way? I, I mean, yes. I was reading yes. recently that, you know, we haven't been as tough as we've needed to be, even when the stakes weren't where they are now. So the, and the, and to that point, you're, that's absolutely true, and we're getting tough, particularly with the, the tariffs saying, hey, it's not going to be a free ride in this country. And they sel selected goods for the initial tariffs. It's about half of what we import from China every year for goods that we can buy from other, that are made mm. in other nations. So it was, it was very wily. And I just wanted to point out uh, how tough she was in the language that she used on the Human Rights Council as well. All yeah, right. Drew okay. uh, we owe one to Adrian. And Tom, yes. so we'll be back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for right now, though, let's get to this. A new era for the Supreme Court as Justice Brett Kavanaugh begins his day one on the new job with protesting going on outside the high court. Can the nation move on from the bitterly partisan confirmation process? We'll talk about it. A new era for the Supreme Court. Justice Brett Kavanaugh taking the bench for the first time today to begin hearing cases. This as protests still continue outside the high court. Last night, President Trump hosting a ceremonial swearing in with all the sitting justices attending. Watch. On behalf of our nation, I want to apologize to Brett and the entire Kavanaugh family for the terrible pain and suffering you have been forced to endure our country, a man or a woman, must always be presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. Justice Kavanaugh saying he's ready to move on and promising to remain impartial as a justice on the high court. The Senate confirmation process was contentious and emotional. That process is over. My focus now is to be the best justice I can be. I take this office with gratitude and no bitterness. On the Supreme Court, I will seek to be a force for stability and unity. My goal is to be a great justice for all Americans and for all of America. Tom, how will a more conservative court how will it change, you think? Well, Justice Kavanaugh's ascension to the Supreme Court is going to be transformative, in my opinion. It is hard to overstate the significance of swapping out Justice Kennedy for Justice Kavanaugh. Justice Kennedy, as we all know, is the quintessential swing vote on so many of the court's most contentious constitutional cases for well over a decade. Sometimes they vote with the liberal contingent, sometimes with the conservatives. Justice Kavanaugh, at least our expectation, I think people anticipate that he will side fairly often with the conservatives. So you go from a universe in which you had a 4-4-1 dynamic to one in which quite often you may have that 5-4 to four dynamic. That said, I don't anticipate the Supreme Court beginning this term by saying, well, what precedents can we overrule? You know, let's take this case, let's take this, let's take this, let's throw them all out. I think that this is a court that is going to proceed methodically. I think they will move slowly with respect for tradition and precedent. So we will see changes. I just don't think we're going to see changes in the next few months. Do you mind if I follow up? Yeah, yeah, real quickly. Can you talk about the dynamic, though, inside the court? Because, you know, so much was talked about after last night from Judge Kavanaugh about how he really tried to bring two sides together. And he'll have to do some of that maybe on the court or no? I, I think he will. And it's a great question because when the Supreme Court decides cases, they do so in the most private way imaginable. They literally go into a closed room with just the nine justices, no one else, and the door is shut. And they discuss, they debate, they say, here's where I'm leaning, here's what I'm doing. And there's a lot of argument and debate 
baiting or maybe even horse trading that goes on behind the scenes. And so I do think that Justice Kavanaugh is going to have a role to play as someone who will on occasion need to reach out to the other side, try to build coalitions, try to persuade people with the force of his legal argument. And so I think for all of the justices, it's a question of saying, look, this was an incredibly partisan process, but it produced Justice Kavanaugh, who is now an equal member of this court, and we welcome him, and he has an important role to play well, going forward. Let's get to the reason that the Democrats, part, <laughs> apologies in advance, Adrian, but the reason that they're so outraged and hysterical over these Supreme Court picks is because they've used the court system, and in some way, the Supreme Court to make law that should have been done through elected officials. So that, in maybe we could get a court that the Democrats don't like, but because they actually have to get people elected to Congress in order to make law, and one that becomes more traditional and focused on the Constitution, not making law out of the high court. I think that's true. And look, I think people on all sides of the political aisle agree that the Supreme Court may have almost assumed too important a role in our society. You look at a lot of issues. I think immigration is a great example where I think many people, probably most Americans, would say this is a case where Congress needs to come in. But for whatever reason, because well, there's of a lot we can say that about. <laughs> absolutely. Congress is not stepping up and deciding these issues. And so by <laughs> default, they get kicked into the Supreme Court, which is called upon to make these decisions that in reality the political branch should be deciding. So I think one of the reasons why we've seen the Democrats get so agitated is because in many of these situations, the Democrats have been looking to the court system to make changes that right. they haven't been able to accomplish through the democratic process. Right. Real quickly, Adrian, what about this talk of impeaching Judge Kavanaugh among Democrats? Mm. Yeah, look, I think that's probably like, you know, talk that you're seeing from, from the far left. And obviously, he was just confirmed. I think, frankly, Democrats, as outraged as we are um, that he was confirmed, I think we've got to move on and take that outrage to the voting booth um, in 29 days. Yeah, when you're talking about impeachment, the, that's you're just short of a belch, <coughs> quite frankly, because you've got nothing else to say if you're talking about impeaching somebody on the high court. Leave it there. <laughs> Four weeks to the day before voters head to the polls, how is the Kavanaugh confirmation battle impacting the midterm races? Fallout from the Kavanaugh confirmation battle is looming large with just four weeks today to go until the critical November midterm elections. Democrats and Republicans saying the fight has led to a surge in donations in their parties. Evidence that the nomination battle has turned into massive energy for November 6th. Last night in Indiana, one of the most competitive races in the nation, Kavanaugh was front and center. The candidates are Democrat Senator Joe Donnelly and Republican businessman Mike Braun. Watch it. Mike was for Judge Kavanaugh on the first day. If President Trump put up Bugs Bunny, Mike would have said he should go on the court. Our job is to protect the court and to put people on who are qualified. The Democrats, including Joe Donnelly, will do or say anything when it comes to their political interests. It is a blood sport. And as long as it's like that, you're going to have decisions made based not on what Hoosiers want, based upon what Chuck Schumer wants. Wow, Adrian, what happened to Joe Donnelly? I thought he was like an old-fashioned blue, <laughs> blue dog. No, not so much? No, he is a blue dog. He is a blue dog. Joe Donnelly won in 2012, 50-44. Um, he defeated a, a very, very well-known Republican in, in a red state. The time is up for re-election. I think he's looking at this the way I wish Joe Manchin, who's also, of course, in cycle from West Virginia, had looked at this, which is if you're going to be a moderate Democrat, you've got to at some point give your base something, right, to get excited about. Um, Joe Donnelly and Joe Manchin are both very big on the Second Amendment. There's a lot of big issues that they can that they side with the Republicans on. I think in this particular issue, Joe, Joe Donnelly took a look. You make that sound like the Second Amendment is a concession. No, <laughs> I know. Everybody's in, in the, the Constitution. Constitution. <laughs> it's in there. Last night, okay, okay. Anyway, anyway, calm again. Safety <laughs> maybe is a better way of putting it. But but the bottom line is, I think Joe Donnelly looked at this. He had a lot of reasons, obviously, for, for opposing Brett Kavanaugh. He came out early on before Heidi Heitkamp and Joe Manchin made their decisions. 
and made it very clear where, where he stands. And I think that his Democratic base in the in the in Indiana will reward him for that. You know, again, I asked this question, nobody's been able to answer it. How big are the bases of these two parties, do you think, Tom? Because if you only get those people to turn out, is that enough to flip the switch on some of these seats? Well, for pro either side. Yeah, probably not, and it will depend on the state. I will say this I think if the Democrats think that Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation is kind of the key to electoral success in November, they are sorely mistaken. The thing that I have seen is that the Republicans, I think, have united around Judge Kavanaugh. Very supportive. You look at battleground poll numbers in some of the critical states we're all focusing on, the Republicans are far more united than the Democrats were. I think there is a sizable percentage of the Democrats, not the it's hardcore base, suburban, but a suburban sizable portion that, that doesn't like how Judge Kavanaugh was Suburban college educated women are the ultimate swing vote, and they are very, very angry right now that Judge Kavanaugh yeah. has been confirmed to the Supreme Court. They are the ones that yeah, Democrats are working to turn that's out. That's the Democrats' yes. problem is you try to speak for all women. Don't treat us like a monolithic group. We're not, but Don't, this is a, this you know what? We're up, uh, some women are upset about the sleaze and manipulation and the deception that we saw by the Democratic senators. I mean, today, that's what they're upset by the about. way, that isn't always um, mutually exclusive from believing or supporting alleged victims like Dr. Ford. I mean, it's talked about like you have to be in one lane or the other, right. but sometimes you can drive down the center, I think, with your own well, position. I, you I, I want to ask Morgan, though, real quickly, what gets you to the polls more, do you think? Anger, mm -hmm. gratitude, joy, <laughs> pure energy? I mean, is this like an Energizer Bunny commercial? I mean, you talk about what right. drives the people actually to the polls. Forget about intensity. Well, especially what during you the midterm. in the polling booth? You're right, because the motivators for the midterm are very different from the motivators during a presidential election year when you have Obama or Trump or someone really motivating at the top of the ticket. I mean, Politico just put out a report, and I think this is interesting, because we talk a lot about this in grandiose schemes, but it actually comes back down to simple math. There's 209 seats that are firmly leaning Democrats. And they have a, the Democrats have a 23 seat deficit to make up in the House, right? Mm -hmm. So they're just, according to Politico's math, they're just nine shy of the 218 needed to win control. Mm -hmm. So what the Republicans have needed is a fundamental shift uh, to not get for the Democrats not to get those nine seats. They need, and, and so I think that Kavanaugh will be part of it, um, will be part of the shift. They're going to have to go race by race because they're being outspent by many of these races. But but it's going to be, I think, uh, Kavanaugh. That's a month from now. Even though we have early voting, we're going to need something else to continue to get Republicans motivated, and I think that's why President Trump is on the trail. Wow, that is an excellent point. 28 days. Thank you. Yeah. I no, got I a mean, who from knows Harris. what we're going to be hey, talking hey. about? Oh, you know, I love you, girl. She's, oh, I please. She's, she is a fountain of compliments. <laughs> I know. I'm Hours excited. after President Trump gave Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein a vote of confidence and a ride on Air Force One. New information raising new questions over the reports that Rosenstein suggested secretly recording President Trump and trying to kick him out of office. This is the deputy AG gets set to meet with House Republicans this week. What they may be discussing with him ahead. All people. A new report raising questions over reports that Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein discussed secretly recording President Trump and removing him from office under the 25th Amendment. Rosenstein has denied these claims and suggested that he was joking. <clears throat> this new report reveals that at least one former top FBI official, James Baker, told congressional investigators that he took Mr. Rosenstein's remarks very seriously. This all comes before Rosenstein meets with House Republicans on Thursday. Here's former Utah Congressman Jason Chaffetz on why that meeting is necessary. What was going on in this meeting? Were they talking about invoking the 25th Amendment? Where, was Rod Rosenstein even considering, even if he was mocking and jesting uh, and saying that maybe I won't do that, I, you know, just taking it to the extreme, there was an underlying conversation with six or seven very senior FBI people in the room, and that's why you've got to have uh, Rod Rosenstein in there talking to members of the Congress. Tom, what do you think comes out of that meeting with the congressional Republicans and Rod Rosenstein? Well, I'm sure the congressional Republicans aren't going to be thrilled with whatever Rosenstein has to say, mm -hmm. uh, is my guess. But I think the most important point is at this, at this stage, it appears, and look, with, with Rod, it's been just kind of day by day for months. I mean, sometimes hour by hour. But the thing is, is at least as of this moment, he appears to have the confidence of the president. After the story initially broke, he went to the White House. They had a sit down. Whatever Rod said to him apparently was enough to appease the president or at least to enable 
him to stay in his job for the time being. He was on Air Force One the other day, for goodness sake. So at least for the moment, the president is satisfied with the performance of his deputy attorney general. I don't know if his meeting with Congress uh, coming up is going to change any of that. Maybe if new allegations surface or he says something, that gives the president a change of heart. But at least for now, it appears that Rosenstein is going to be safe. Well, Morgan, it looks, because you have both Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who the president is not pleased with, and then these allegations about Rod Rosenstein, do both of them go after the midterms? Do they both get fired in a tweet on the night of the midterm elections? And I, I'm actually kind of not joking about that. Well, we now have a U.N. ambassador to confirm uh, after the midterms. And so I do I think that we're going to be able to confirm both uh, an attorney general and a deputy? No, I think that that's, that's a lot on the confirmation front. So I don't see that happening. But I think it's important to remember, Dagan, that who are making these accusations? This is McCabe and Lisa Page, both who have been fired, both who have lost a lot of credit ability among mainstream, definitely among Republicans, but I think a lot of many mainstream Americans, they clearly had an agenda from day one, not only against the president, but against people working for him. Um, to think that Rod Rosenstein was a part of some fantasy with two other cabinet officials to invoke the 25th Amendment. I mean, people need to go watch Game of Thrones or go watch some other television show because they clearly are getting way too creative in their free time. I mean, I just don't believe, I think it's ludicrous that that happened. I think that these are fanciful things uh, that McCabe and Page made up because they were trying to sow chaos into this administration. And um, I frankly don't want to hear anything else from them. And also, Adrian, get back at Rod Rosenstein. He was also wrote the memo that was the justification for the firing of Jim Comey as well. Yeah, I mean, who knows, right? I mean, you've got two agents to the point that Morgan just made who have been largely discredited, who both, you know, regardless of where, you're, where you sit on the political aisle, you know, they, they don't exactly have a giant fan club of, of people out there. <laughs> But, but, you know, look, if you're Rod Rosenstein, I mean, I certainly don't want, want him to resign for, for a lot of obvious reasons. But if you're him, why stay at this point? Every, and same with Sessions. At this point, you wonder, you wake up every day and wonder, is this the day that I'm going to be fired by tweet? Um, am I still going to be in the White House? Or, I mean, I'm sorry, am I still going to have my cabinet position? Um, it, so, you know, we'll see what happens after the midterms. But I have a feeling that both of these guys. You think both, both of them? I, I, I don't know. That I, mean, was, I, have every, I think we have every reason to think that it could be both of them. Tom, real quick, your final word on that. Do you think they both go or at least one of them stays? I, I think there's a good chance both are gone. I mean, look, the fact is, is the president wants and frankly deserves to have people that he has full confidence. And I am a supporter of the attorney general and the deputy attorney general. I think that they have been doing a good job, notwithstanding you, all the political noise. Are you putting noise. your name in the hat? So, well, I, I haven't ruled anything <laughs> out, but I'm happy with my day job. Um, but at any rate, I do think that they have been doing a good job. And we'll see. It's ultimately up to the president. It's his call. He deserves to have the people he wants in those jobs. Right. Thanks, Tom. More outnumbered in a moment. Thank you, Tom Dupree. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. A blast I, as always. I know, as, as Harris said, pack your bag full <laughs> of breaking news the next time you come because we loved having you. I'll do it. We're back tomorrow at noon Eastern. Right now, here's Harris Faulkner.